Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Emily Kelly. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the International Interior Design Association. Um, welcome to the second installment of the IIDA ASID Joint Advocacy Webinar Series. Um, this series is entitled How to Win Friends and Influence Policymakers. Um, today we have with us Andrew Goldberg, who will be the presenter um, for this webinar. Um, Andrew um, is, uh, has founded a firm, Agora Communications, and, um, and will be in, in Washington, D.C., um, and he will be doing this presentation for us today. A um, couple of quick housekeeping um, points to go over. Um, in terms of questions, we will tr take questions at the end. Um, we'll try to answer as many as we can. To ask a question, uh, you'll see on your right-hand side of your screen um, the question tab, and you can click on that, and you'll be able to expand it and, um, and ask a question. And we'll take as many of those as we can at the end. Um, this will be recorded, uh, as was our first um, joint webinar. So it will be available to view afterwards um, on IIDA and ASID's website. And then last but not least, um, CEU information. Uh, this presentation is uh, one CEU credit, and um, but it is only available as a CEU if you're watching the live version here. So we have a list of everyone who's registered to attend um, after the presentation. Um, ASID is going to uh, take all the registered attendees and do the uh, reporting for you uh, to IDCEC. So you should see that come up on your account within a couple weeks. Um, if you don't, uh, please reach out and let us know. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Andrew, and he'll tell you a little bit about himself, and then we'll get the presentation started. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. Great. Well, thanks so much, Emily, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, being on the webinar today. Um, I'm really delighted to be here with ASID and IIDA uh, in talking a bit about how um, all of you can become better, more effective advocates. Um, a little bit about myself, as Emily said, I am co-founder of a consulting firm here in Washington, D.C. called Agora. That's mission really is to help uh, people and organizations and groups uh, become better and more effective advocates. Um, I, I've worked on Capitol Hill for a number of years. Uh, for about 15 years, I worked for uh, an organization that many of you know well, the American Institute of Architects, or AIA, running government relations for them. Uh, and the things that we're going to talk about today really are about uh, what we did at AIA and what I saw uh, from citizen advocates like all of you when I worked on Capitol Hill and the effective ways that uh, people can build relationships with their elected officials and, and get things done and, and advance really strong policy. So in our first webinar back in February, we talked at a high level about advocacy, uh, what it is and why it's important uh, to be an advocate for your profession uh, and the various roles of lobbyists and grassroots advocates. Uh, today, we're gonna get into a little more detail and, and hone in on the importance of building relationships with policymakers and the tools that you can use to actually build those relationships. To begin with, uh, we'll start with three kind of basic questions about relationships with government officials. First, why is it important to build these relationships? Second, what, what do we mean? How do we define that kind of relationship? And three, uh, why do we need advocates to do that? Isn't building relationships what lobbyists are for. So the first question, why is it important to build relationships uh, with our elected uh, representatives? Um, isn't it enough to have you know, a good idea? It, you have a good idea for a bill. Um, shouldn't it be enough to be able to just go up to your state representative or your congressman and ask them uh, to support it? And if it's a good idea, they would. Why do we need to build a whole relationship with it? Well, getting good policy enacted, it does require having good ideas, of course, but the thing is there are a lot of good ideas out there and legislators have a very finite bandwidth uh, to hear them all. At the state level, there are about uh, 200,000 bills 
that are introduced every year in state legislatures across the country. Um, and so it's for each state legislator, they're having to deal with or think about hundreds and hundreds of bills, usually in a, a legislative session that goes for maybe six months or so. Um, they have tons of people coming to them, asking them to take positions on various issues, uh, pro and con, and they are constantly being bombarded by, by good policy ideas. And it can be very difficult for them to know which are the good ideas and which one aren't as good. Um, there's another reason also, which is that, as I said, there are thousands of bills introduced every year, but only a small number of them actually move forward and get passed by a committee and get passed by the legislature and become law. And you need to have legislators who are champions for you, who really understand the issues and are committed to passing it to make sure those bills move move through. So having a good idea is not enough. You have to be able to build that trust. Not only that, but what you might think is a really good policy idea, somebody else might not think so. Uh, and your opponents are going to be making the case to the policymakers why they should oppose your position. With all this information flying around, all these issues, all these different points of view, how do policymakers decide what positions uh, to take? And more to the point, how do they assess the reliability, the credibility of the information that they're getting? And the answer really is trust. Uh, when a policymaker trusts that a person or group has good ideas, makes sound arguments, uh, uses facts to make their case, and is genuinely looking out for the public interest, they're more likely to trust them and trust the information they provide. So how do you build that trust? Um, well, it takes time. There are no shortcuts to it. Uh, but we're going to talk today about how you do that, how you build that, that level of trust. Now, the second question I asked was, uh, what do we mean by a relationship? When we say having a, a good relationship with a elected official, does it mean that you contribute a lot to their campaign financially? Is it somebody that you've known since you were in kindergarten and, and a good friend with? Well, not necessarily. Uh, a relationship in the advocacy world really is a collaboration between a policymaker and an advocate where both of you have aligned goals and work to achieve them in an environment of mutual trust. It is, in many respects, no different than a business relationship between uh, an interior designer and a client or with a product supplier. There is a transaction element to it to some extent, but it's, it's, it's deeper than that. Um, when you build a relationship with a potential client as an interior designer, uh, it's true the ultimate goal, of course, is to provide them a service in exchange for, for money. But that relationship only works if you trust each other and if you're clear about each other's goals and what you're looking for. And as with a relationship with a product supplier, a strong relationship with policymakers is one where you can work together on an ongoing basis. So what is it you're looking for? What do both sides get out of this relationship? Um, your goal, of course, uh, when you build a relationship with a policymaker is to advance public policy, to get a bill passed or a regulation changed and so on. But you also need to understand what they are looking for, the policymaker. And what are policymakers looking for? What are their needs? Generally speaking, they have two motivations. It's to make a difference and keep their job, which in that sense are not different than the rest of us, right? Um, first of all, they wanna make a difference. They wanna use their power in the legislature to affect change, maybe on a large scale, say on environmental issues and dealing with climate change, or maybe on a, a local scale, uh, helping their community become more prosperous. Uh, sometimes their desire to make a change comes from you know, pure personal ambition or desire to leave a legacy. Uh, but whatever the motivation is, by bringing problems and solutions to, to elected officials, you're helping them make a difference and achieve that. Um, second, as I said, you know, they want to keep their jobs, which means getting reelected. And there's nothing wrong with that. Most of us would like to keep our jobs. And to win an election, uh, elected officials need a few things. Well, they need accomplishments that they can tout to the voters. Um, they need people and organizations to help them in their campaign by providing endorsements or volunteering. And yes, they need money to actually pay for the campaign. 
And we'll talk a little bit about how you can help policymakers in the campaign context a little bit later on in this webinar. But a good relationship with a policymaker is one where each of you understands each other's objectives and helps each other achieve them in line with your principles. Now, let's say you don't already have a relationship with a lawmaker. You haven't known them since you were in kindergarten. Is it too late? Um, well, not at all. Elected representatives understand that part of their job is to engage with the community, engage with their constituents. Um, they understand that, that your interest is to advance good policy. That's why they are there to represent your interests in the state capitol or in, in Washington, D.C. And you don't have to have known them forever. Uh, the key to building relationships is to build them early, um, to, to, to build that trust factor like we talked about. And that's really important. The third question then is, is, well, why do grassroots advocates need to do that? Isn't that why you have IIDA and ASID and, and what lobbyists are for? Now, to go back to the first webinar, we talked a little bit about the differences between uh, advocates and lobbyists. And as a quick refresher, the lobbyists are professionals who engage in advocacy for a living. That's their job. Um, at the federal level, at the state level, uh, they need to register with the government as lobbyists so that the public can see what they're lobbying on and who they're lobbying for. Advocates, on the other hand, are, are just regular people who are volunteering their time to advocate and don't have to register and, in fact, shouldn't register as lobbyists. Um, in practice, they're doing the same thing. They're building relationships with policymakers to affect change, but in a slightly different way, professional versus kind of on a volunteer basis. And as we discussed in the first webinar, lobbyists do play a very important role in the process because they're working full time to keep tabs on what the legislature is doing. They also have relationships with lawmakers. But as we also discussed, grassroots engagement is always going to be more effective than professional lobbyists. Uh, studies show that direct constituent interactions have more influence on lawmakers' decisions than other advocacy strategies. And in the case of federal government, as that chart on the screen shows, members of Congress and their staff really place a premium on hearing from groups and citizens that have built relationships with their elected officials. Most legislators, if they have the choice between meeting with a professional lobbyist or a constituent from back home, they're going to want to meet with the constituent. Uh, it's that simple. So to sum up, you know, relationships are about building trust with policymakers in an environment where both of you are working together towards a certain goals. Um, it's important to do that so that legislators uh, are able to see your issues and be able to have your issues rise to the top of all the information they're getting. And it's important as constituents, as citizen advocates, to build those relationships with your elected officials directly. Okay, so if that's important, how do you do it? How do you gain access uh, with your personal legislators, uh, your lawmakers, and build that relationship? Well, there are a few very easy steps to do that. Um, if you're advocating on behalf of the interior design profession, the very first step is to reach out to your organization, to reach out to ASID or IIDA. They may already have a relationship with your representatives. Uh, they also know what the key issues are and where the representative stands on those issues. But let's say that ASID and IIDA uh, don't have a strong relationship with a specific legislator, specific legislator. And in fact, let's say they call you up and they want you to build that relationship. How do you do that? Well, the first step is pretty simple. It's a matter of calling up their office and asking for a meeting. Usually that's all you need to do. If you are a constituent, you can call up your state representatives, your local city council members, your member of Congress and ask for a meeting. And that's usually all it takes. Uh, but there are other times when it may take a little more uh, work. You might need to go to one of their town hall or constituent meetings uh, or a constituent coffee, many of them have, or other events that they organize to engage with the public. And you may need to you know, introduce yourself to them there. Or you may want to work with your organization's lobbyists to help get that meeting. We'll talk a little bit later on in this webinar about some of the really tough cases if you really have a hard time getting to uh, engage with your legislator. But for the most part, 
all it takes really is a phone call and you can get a meeting with your legislator. Now, before you have that meeting, there are a couple of things that you have to do in order to make sure that that meeting is as successful as possible. You have to do some research and you have to think about what it is you wanna get out of that meeting. So to begin with, research. Um, before you meet with a legislator, you wanna learn as much as you can about them. Uh, what are their biggest policy priorities? What are they really passionate about? Is it the environment or is it taxes or small business? Um, what issues do they maybe don't care about as much? Knowing what they're not interested in is very helpful. Um, what are their, what are the big projects that they've worked on that they want to be their legacy, their big pieces of leg legislation? Um, have they made statements or comments or taken positions on issues that relate to interior design in the past? They already have a position. Uh, have they engaged with interior designers in the past? And what's their occupation? Uh, most state legislators and, and local uh, officials often have, have day jobs. Uh, it, knowing what they actually do can be very helpful. For example, if they work in the building industry or the design industry, uh, well, that's good to know because they may already have some understanding and engagement with interior designers. Um, do they have any future ambitions? Are they looking to run for a higher seat someday or for governor or Congress or things like that? Knowing more about them really helps you understand who they are and what makes them tick. And also, where is their hometown? Where are they from? Uh, that may help also because you may have connections with that community. Uh, now, where you find all that information about them, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, the internet makes things very, very simple uh, to find information. Every state legislature uh, the country has a website, and on that website, there's a page where you can look up basic information about your legislator. On the screen there is uh, actually my own state assemblyman and information about him, what committees he's on. Uh, you can find other information about bills he's working on and so on. And you can Google them and find out more about kind of what they do. So just getting to know them before you meet with them helps you understand better about what they're interested in and how you can really engage with them to, to make the meeting successful. The second thing you want to think about before meeting with the legislator uh, is, is the overall message. Um, what it is you're going to bring to them, how are you going to present yourself, what are you going to talk about? Now, in a, in a future webinar, we're going to go in, in a lot more detail about how to conduct a successful lawmaker constituent meeting. But today, I want to talk a little bit about what you want to think about, what you want to prepare, what your goal is. Uh, in getting out of that meeting. And to launch a new relationship with a lawmaker, you really have three goals, uh, educating, listening, and sustaining. So educating. Uh, the goal of meeting with a legislator is to make sure they're aware of your profession um, and why you're advocating. First of all, your profession. Most people, I think, have heard of interior designers, but a lot of people may have misconceptions about interior design, you know, what your specific skills are as a designer, what kind of projects you work on, the level of education you need to earn, uh, you know, to become an interior designer. Um, they may not know these things, or they may have heard uh, information from others that isn't quite accurate. So you want to leave that first engagement with a legislator, uh, with them having a better picture of who interior designers are, uh, why they, they are important, and why they matter. Then you want to make sure that they understand why it is you're advocating, you know, why interior designers care about policy. What are the major issues that impact the profession? What are the major policy debates that you care about? And both ASIED and IIDA have a ton of, of resources about those issues, and they put on webinars like this one about some of those policy issues, and you can find out what those specific policy items are. Um, but this is also a time uh, when some of the research you've done kicks in. For example, if the legislator you're meeting with is very pro-business, you may want to highlight the business aspects of interior design about how you are small business people who really contribute to the community and create jobs. If the legislator you know based upon their record and statements uh, is very passionate about environmental issues, then maybe you want to talk more about sustainability and the role of interior designers in creating a more sustainable environment. The goal is to make sure they have a good sense of, of who you are and what you care about 
And the more you could match what you're talking about with what they really care about, the more effective it's going to be because you're going to find that common interest. So educating is the first step in any meeting, any first engagement. So they understand who you are and what makes you tick. The second goal then is listening. It's to find out what, what makes them tick and make sure that you understand who you are. Remember that a relationship, any kind of relationship, is a two-way street. It's not just about you telling them what you want them to do. You want to give them a chance to talk about what they care about and how perhaps you can help them. You want to hear what the big issues that they're working on. Um, what is their take on the issues that you raised? Uh, are they supportive? Are they less supportive? Are they not sure? Um, is there's a, if there's a policy idea that they're working on that relates somehow to interior design, uh, you want to show them that you're listening to them and that you're a good sounding board. Um, and if they, if, you, if, if they share they're really passionate about something, say maybe helping uh, underserved communities or working with children, for example, you know, talk about ways in which you can help them and, and do that. Showing them that you really care about their agenda shows uh, it helps to really build that level of trust. Listening also helps you kind of identify areas where maybe they don't see eye to eye with you, which helps you kind of go back and then think about and strategize about new ways of getting them onto your side. So again, you educate, and then you listen to what they have to say, what makes them uh, passionate, what they care about. The third and final goal of that initial engagement is sustaining. It's leaving that meeting with a plan for continuing the dialogue. You know, building a relationship takes more than one single meeting. It takes a sustained uh, engagement over a long period of time. And you wanna leave that first meeting with a plan on how you're gonna keep, uh, keep engaged. How do you do that? How do you maintain that relationship beyond that first meeting? Well, here are a few tips. Here are a few things that you can do when you engage with your elected representatives to help make sure that the relationship moves forward. Uh, first of all, you can help be a resource to them. Um, as you hear of information or data that could be of use to them in their work, uh, send it to them. If ASID or IIDA come out with a new study or a new report on the state of interior design, for example, use that as a chance to re-engage with the lawmaker. They'll begin to see you as a trusted, uh, sincere, valued resource. And that is, is really is so important to, to keeping that two-way dialogue going. Second is you can invite them to an event, um, help continue their education process into interior design by inviting them to visit you at, at your firm, for example, or at a project you just worked on, or even at an IIDA or an ASID chapter meeting. And I think you can get a, a, a number of interior designers together at one of these events it really helps expand the discussion. Um, Emily at IIDA told me that uh, a number of the chapters in IIDA do just that. Uh, the Wisconsin chapter has been working with a couple of other related organizations to do joint tours of spaces where they've all worked together. Um, one of the chapters in New England uh, has invited a legislator to attend the chapter's annual design uh, award show. These kinds of steps kind of help to build that relationship, build trust, and make sure that interior design remains high on the legislator's mind. Third is go to their events, take part in their events, uh, like town halls. Even just showing up and a quick hello to the, to the legislator can help remind them of who you are and also shows that, yeah, you're paying attention and that you're engaged in the process. Um, one really good example of this is that the uh, Columbus, Ohio uh, IIDA chapter uh, had uh, arranged for a, a number of their members attend an International Women's Day event that was hosted by all the local and state elected officials in the Columbus, Ohio area. So here's an opportunity again where interior designers can then engage again with all of these elected officials. That helps keep that relationship going. Uh, fourth, uh, take part in something important to them. If, if there's some way you can make a connection, uh, if they're involved in a charity, let's say, they're involved with Habitat for Humanity, for example. Uh, find ways to get involved with that and work with them to help do that. Using your skills as an interior designer to help uh, to contribute to their passions and what they're working on in the community can also solidify that relationship. 
Um, you can also, last but not least, offer briefings. Um, you can offer to bring you and some of your colleagues to the state capitol uh, to do a briefing with your own legislator, its sponsor, and invite uh, their colleagues to attend. Uh, this makes them look good because they're bringing resources to their colleagues, and it gives you the chance then to actually help educate even more uh, legislators. Um, if, the, if your legislator is a member of a caucus, like a woman's caucus or a Hispanic caucus, you can offer to do an event where you help to brief a larger group of lawmakers on um, interior design. In fact, uh, a group of, of interior designers in Oklahoma, uh, just I guess a few months ago, did an event in Tulsa uh, for members of the Oklahoma Women's Caucus. It's a great way to really build those relationships. Now, a question always comes up is, well, how often do we need to really engage with our legislators? Do we need to do this like once a month? Um, no. Um, remember that legislators are really busy, and there are a lot of folks uh, trying to get their attention and invite them to events, and you don't want to harass them. Um, there's no right or wrong frequency on how often you want to engage, but ideally you want to try to do it at least two, time, two times a year, because uh, that's going to help sustain the relationship. Any less than that, just going in once a year to meet with them probably is not going to really build that relationship, at least not, at least not very quickly. So as I said, you know, building that relationship initially with a lawmaker is not difficult. It's a matter of calling them up, uh, getting a meeting, doing some research about them to learn what they care about, taking part in that meeting and finding out uh, what makes them tick, educating them about who you are and what you care about, and then also finding ways to maintain that relationship over time. Having said that, sometimes um, it's a little more difficult. Sometimes there are some legislators who are hard to, to build that relationship with. Um, as crazy as it sounds, there sometimes are legislators who don't uh, engage with the community as much as they should. In some cases, they may be in, in part of leadership, and so their, their, their schedules are even uh, tighter and more difficult to, to, to crack open. Or you just may have some trouble really building that trusting relationship with them. So what do you do in that situation? Well, one thing that we did at AIA a lot is we did something called a power map. So a power map is a visual tool that social advocates use to identify people and groups that have connections and influence over the person that you're trying to build a relationship with. Um, it's basically a form of trying to create a bigger network and find your way into their network. Now, why does this work? Well, for a few reasons. One, we live in a very interconnected world and understanding the broader network in which a policymaker operates helps you get a better understanding of what they care about and drives their passion and find ways to get into their network. Second is, you know, policymakers meet lots of people all the time, but they build trust slowly. Many elected officials have a fairly small inner circle of, of people who influence them, whose people whose views they really trust. And it may take you time to get into that circle, but if there are people who are in that circle who can vouch for you, uh, that can help you build that relationship. And third, building a power map helps you find connections to the legislator that you don't even realize. Um, they may belong to a club or an organization that your business part partner belongs to or have some other connection. Maybe they went to school. Uh, with someone that used to work with. And so building a power map helps you to find those kinds of connections. So what is a power map? Um, basically, it is really just a chart that shows a network of relationships between a policymaker that you're trying to engage with and all of the groups, clubs, businesses, schools, everything else uh, that they engage with. Think of it as kind of like LinkedIn a little bit. Uh, you draw the target in the center. In this case, it's the fictional Delegate Smith. And then you go outwards, identifying uh, people and organizations that they have a connection with, uh, various associations they belong to in the community, where they went to school, places they've worked in their professional life, um, other political connections that they have from their work in the legislature, uh, the groups they work with or have been endorsed by, or groups that uh, or interests that they've shown based on what they've introduced. By building out this map, you're beginning to get a fuller picture of their life, their interests, and what they do. 
Now, how do you find this information? Again, as I said earlier, it's about research. And in fact, you can find out a heck of a lot uh, by going to their website on the state legislature's page or the, the congressional page. Um, here is, I, I picked a very, at random, a, a state assemblyman from New York City, just to give an example of how this works. So here is uh, Assemblyman Brian Barnwell uh, from New York. Just looking at this short bio, you can already pick out a number of different potential connections that you could make to him. Um, you see he's a resident of the community of Woodside in Queens. Maybe you know people there. Um, he went to Arizona State University and got his law degree in Albany. Uh, he did work uh, on civil rights and disabilities issues before. Um, he also had worked for a time for another councilman uh, before he became a, 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 a state legislator. Um, he, he volunteers with the, this group, City Harvest, that helps feed the needy. Um, he also does a lot of work, it seems, with seniors and veterans. So maybe there are organizations that, that you know, or people you know who work with seniors or veterans who may know him. And what you do when you build that power map is you take all this information about them, all the various things they do, the clubs they belong to, the places they've worked, the other politicians that they've worked with, and you start to try to find some connections. Um, are there former uh, colleagues of yours who may have some connection to them? Are there other interior designers, people, members of AFID or IIDA? Um, other associations or colleagues you have who are engineers or architects or real estate people or whatever who may know them. Other clients of yours uh, that may have some connection with them. Are there community groups? Um, you then find out these are people who know or may know this delegate. And so you can then reach out to those individuals um, and you may help use them to maybe learn a little more about this delegate, find out what they care about, what makes them tick get some advice and the best way to approach them. You could even request an introduction if somebody you know, if your next door neighbor turns out knows this delegate very well, maybe they'll help you build that connection. And of course, you know, ASID and IIDA are, are there to help you with these kinds of tough cases of legislators who aren't as accessible as you'd like them to be. Uh, but this is a very effective way to find more avenues to engage with the legislator. It's rare that you need to do this, but no matter who the elected official is, there is a way to build that relationship with them. Okay, so as we talked about, your goal here is to build a strong relationship with a, an elected official. How do you know if you've done that, if you have a good relationship with an elected official? Um, what makes that? What makes it a good relationship? Ultimately, the test is: Are you able to get good policy passed? But that could take some time, and it's not always clear to what extent your relationship with an elected official made that happen. So there are a couple of ways that you can kind of measure the strength of your relationship with an elected official. Uh, one is: Are you on their list, so to speak, their email list? Are you invited to constituent events if they hold constituent coffees in their district? or town halls, are you getting their emails? Second is, do they return your calls? Um, you know, if you call them, uh, do they call you back? Um, are they, you know, are they actually willing to reach out back to you? Third is, are they reaching out to you first? Uh, if there's an issue that comes up in the legislature that they think may impact interior designers, uh, then if they're reaching out to you and saying, hey, there's a bill coming up that may affect you. What do you think about it? Uh, that's a very good sign that you have a good relationship because that shows they trust you and they want to get your feedback. And last but not least, what I call a supermarket test. If you ran into them in the supermarket, would they recognize you? Would they, do they, know, do they know who you are? And these really are the goals of building that relationship, having a, a two-way communication and engagement where they know who you are, they trust you, and they're willing to, to ask you for, for advice and information uh, so that when it comes time for you to ask them to support you on an issue, you can be more sure that they're willing to listen to you and help you. Now, what we've talked about here is building relationships with, uh, with elected officials. And 
creating somebody, create, turning an elected official into a friend in the legislature is, like I said, not hard. Uh, but what, we, what you really want and what the goal of a lot of organizations to do is to turn a friend into a champion. So what do I, what do I mean by a friend and a champion? So a friend in, in the advocacy world is a legislator who will vote uh, with you when a bill comes up. They, they will generally support your position if they are forced to take a vote on an issue. If you ask them to take action, to send a letter to the governor or sponsor a bill, they may take action. They may do that if you ask them. Uh, if other issues come up that impact interior design, they, they might reach out to you. And that's all that's very good. A champion, on the other hand, is is a elected official who is somebody who is really going to be there for you and has your back and is going to work very diligently to help you in a real partnership. That is somebody who's going to introduce legislation on your behalf. They are going to be the, the, the original sponsor of a bill that, that you want them that you want the legislature to pass. And they will actively advocate for you with their colleagues. As I said before, there are thousands of bills introduced every year, and most don't see the light of day. A champion is somebody who's going to try to make sure that your bill and your priority, your issue, is at the top of the list. And they're going to talk to the committee chairman and to the leadership to try to get your bill passed. A champion is somebody who is going to take action if you ask them. You don't have to worry about it. You know they're on your side and they're going to support you. And it's somebody who's going to consult with you when other things come up. They're the ones who are going to reach out to you at a moment's notice and ask you. Having champions in the legislature is so important. It's something that we at AIA did a lot in order to make sure that we had people who uh, we know we could count on when there were issues coming up. And it's something I know that ASID and IIDA do as well. Um, and I, you know, talking with Emily and the folks at ASID, I know they're, if they've been able to rely upon a number of champions to really help them. Um, for example, they, they said that in Utah in 2016, they had a state sem senator who was able to force, uh, really make sure that architects uh, came to the table and negotiated with interior designers on some license licensing bills. Were it not for the fact that this state senator was a champion for interior designers, really understood them, supported them, was with them, um, that might not have happened. Um, and so having champions is very important. Now, not every member, of course, is going to be a champion because every group out there, every interest wants to identify certain elected lawmakers as their champions. But, but, but finding those members who can really be your friend, your ally uh, in, in, on the inside is so important. And here's the thing. You can help turn your own representative into a champion for the profession. So how do you do that? There are a few ways. Um, one is you, know, you invite them to not just any old event, but the big events. Maybe invite them to your convention or a conference as a keynote speaker. Another thing you can do, which a lot of groups do, is you can give them awards. Many state associations, many national associations have awards for legislator of the year, uh, for people who have shown over the years a real commitment to the profession. Um, IIDA, for example, actually has uh, a legislator of the year award process uh, that on an as-needed basis they can award those. Now normally you might give that to somebody who's already been a champion for you, but you know what, you can give it to somebody who is a potential champion to encourage them to then take that next step up and really support you. Um, a way to get somebody to become a champion is ask them to be a sponsor of a bill. If ASID and uh, IIDA are pushing legislation in the state, uh, a licensure bill or, or whatever, Asking your member to, to be a, an original sponsor of that bill is a great way to make them a champion, to, to make them invested in the success of that legislation and your policy. Asking them to advocate for you, asking them if they would then talk to some of their colleagues on, on your behalf about a certain bill is a very important way to do that. You can also ask them to do publicity for you. Uh, they can write an op-ed for the local newspaper or you could actually write it for them and they could you know, sign it and send it in and do some publicity. Lawmakers are always looking for ways to, to get their name out there, to, to, to be in the media. Um, so finding ways to help them by giving them content that they can put out there. 
that supports your position, helps raise their profile. It's a win-win for both of you. And that's the way you kind of build somebody into a champion. And last but not least, you would help support them in their campaign. And that really is the last piece that I want to talk about today, which is about how you build relationships, is how you use the campaign process. As I said, elected officials, you know, they like to keep their jobs, which is fine. Uh, and that means winning elections. Uh, most state legislators are, are, are up for re-election every two years or so. Um, and if you have an elected representative who is somebody who is good, who champions your issues, or at least listens, um, you may want to consider being involved in their campaign to help them get reelected. Now, I want to offer a very, very, very clear disclaimer. Um, when and if you get involved in campaign activities, you should never, ever condition that involvement on either passage or blocking specific legislation. And this is especially true in the case of campaign contributions money. Uh, giving a candidate a campaign contribution on the express condition that they vote a certain way, that's not only a bad idea, it's illegal. So it's never about a quid pro quo. It's never about uh, saying, I will support your campaign because you voted for me. Uh, but supporting people who are good legislators, who, who are listened, who are engaged, who care, who are just champions generally, and yet and understand the profession is a very good way to be involved. Um, and this is especially true with, with newer candidates, somebody who's never been in that office before. Uh, as I said, you're building a relationship with a lawmaker early on is very important. Uh, the earlier you build it, the better. So if you can build that relationship before they're even in office, well, that's doubly valuable. Um, you know, elected officials remember who was with him in the beginning. And if you're engaged at the outset, uh, you have more chances than educate them on what interior designers do. And this is something we did and tried to do a lot at the AIA. Uh, when you had state representatives who were running for Congress, if it was somebody that the AIA state chapter had a really good relationship with, at the federal level, we would then you know, really encourage and help their campaign. So when they got to Congress, they already knew about architects, they knew about the AIA, and they'd become champions. Some of our biggest champions at the federal level were people who had been state senators and state reps before that and worked with our local chapters. The earlier you get involved with a candidate, the more powerful, the more uh, strong that relationship is. So how do you get involved? Well, the first way is money, of course. Um, it's no secret that money plays a big role in politics. And the reality is, yes, candidates do need money to pay for campaign staff, to pay for mailers or, or ads or to open a campaign office and so on. Now, pretty much every state, I think it's every state almost, has a limitation on, on how much money any one person can give to a candidate. And because of that, your campaign contribution is not gonna make the difference usually in whether or not a candidate wins the race or loses. But candidates appreciate the fact that you're willing to give financially to help them. And when you do donate to a candidate, you often have the chance then to meet the candidate uh, in person at an event uh, that gives you more chances to, to talk with them and engage with them, educate them about who interior designers are, as well as listen to them. Um, at the state level, and certainly the local level, uh, you know, there aren't as many donors. If you look at the chart on the screen there, that shows the average cost of running for those seats in 2016. So, you know, in the millions at the federal level, a lot less at the state level. And so by donating to state candidates, you really have the ability to stand out and build that relationship. And although there is a limit on how much you can give to a candidate, um, you can also encourage your friends and colleagues and fellow interior designers to give as well. Uh, so a lot of times campaigns will ask donors, you know, where they heard about the candidate or, or who encouraged them to give. So if somebody gives money to a campaign and says you are the one who encouraged them, um, it shows the candidate that you are truly committed and that you're really helping them to get ahead and to, to, to get into office. But besides money, the other real way in which you can help uh, show a candidate your support and your commitment is by, is by giving uh, of your time and volunteering on a campaign. Um, volunteering is a great way to show uh, your commitment to the candidate. It's also a lot of fun. I'll tell you what's way that I got started in politics about 25 years ago, volunteering on campaigns, and it is a ton of fun. 
And it can be any number of activities from getting on the phone, calling voters to remind them to come out and vote on election day. Uh, it can be going door to door, putting door hangers on people's doors to remind them how to vote. You could hold uh, a reception or an event or something in your firm or even your home uh, to help your neighbors or your colleagues to meet the candidate. Uh, you could drive people to the polls. Have programs to help uh, senior citizens and people with disabilities get to the polls by driving them. If you help out on a campaign, candidates will remember that and they will remember that and they appreciate that. And you also have a very good chance of then meeting the candidate as well. Again, another way to engage with him. And this is something that a lot of people do and a lot of interior designers have done to great effect. Um, again, talking with IIDA and ASID, they've told me about cases where uh, interior designers in Colorado have gone door knocking for candidates. Um, people in you know, Wisconsin, interior designers in Wisconsin, uh, held fundraisers for uh, various Republican and Democratic candidates in North Carolina, hosted a fundraiser. All of these kinds of events, these activities, again, help you demonstrate to a, an elected official that you are committed to working with them, that you want to engage in the process, and that helps you, again, build that relationship and build trust, all of which helps you get to a point where you can then be in a better position to advocate for legislation and get policies passed. So to sum up, and then we can turn it over to questions. Um, relationships, as I said, you know, they're based upon trust and shared goals, and they are built over time. There's no, there are no shortcuts to building a good relationship. Um, the grassroots efforts, you know, ordinary citizens doing this, backed by their associations, uh, providing support, are the strongest relationships that you can you can create, and they're very important. It's important to know the people you want to build relationships with. Doing that research, finding out what makes them tick, what issues they care about, what connections they have to your community and, and to the larger world. Uh, making sure that when you engage with a, with an elected official, especially the first time, educate them on the profession, on why the profession matters, on what the profession cares about. Listening to them, what they care about, and then finding ways to sustain that relationship. Because remember, you know, one meeting, one chance to talk with a legislator, that's not a relationship yet. That's a start. It's just the start. Um, finding ways to cultivate champions, to really turn uh, elected officials into champions for your causes and for your issues just makes your job so much easier because to have people on the inside who can then advocate for you with their colleagues helps you get legislation passed. And, and not forgetting about campaigns, a great way to build relationships. Um, you know, I'll end by saying that, you know, in my time, I've been on both sides. I've been a staff person to members of Congress and worked on campaigns for candidates. And I've been a lobbyist on the outside. And at times I've been a citizen advocate also. And really building a relationship with a policymaker, uh, showing, demonstrating that you are in it for the long haul, that you are sincere about what you are doing that you bring good, smart policy ideas to them, and that you, you genuinely care also about what they care about and are willing to work with them, that is, is so critical and so essential to in, in passing good policy. And it'll help uh, the profession, it'll help all of you become better at, at advocating and helps you really truly make a difference uh, in policy. So with that, um, I want to thank you. I want to turn it back now to Emily uh, to see if there are any questions or comments uh, about um, any of this. So Emily, back to you. Yep. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, that was great. Really informative, informative tons of good information. Uh, we do have a handful of questions. We've got about five more minutes um, to go through them. Um, and then I'll let you guys know about the next webinar we have coming up. So. The first one that I want to start with, um, I think it's a really good one, be just because, um, especially I think over the past couple of years, a lot of our efforts have really um, become more advanced on the state level. Like Andrew mentioned, we're, we're going to fundraisers, we're um, having legislators tour firms and projects and things like that. We've really stepped up a lot of our grassroots efforts throughout the country. Um, and so, but again, with that political giving, it can get very confusing. So um, 
wanted to start with what's the difference between giving a donation to a candidate versus giving one to a PAC? Um, and Andrew, if you have thoughts on that. Sure, it's a great question. Um, and to begin with, um, I don't know if people know, but just in case you don't, a PAC uh, is a political action committee or PAC at, at, the, at the federal level, the state level uh, generally, and they are the funds, financial funds that are uh, organized by either associations or, or companies or groups of people that enable people to kind of pool their money together and then the PAC gives a donation to a candidate. Um, so PACs are something that a number of organizations uh, use uh, to help build their influence or in their, in, in their kind of profile because uh, an organization can then give a PAC donation to a candidate and say, this is coming from you know, a group of a, whatever profession or whatever the group is. Um, honestly, I think in many ways, both are important. Uh, giving individually to a candidate, especially those who are your champion, is a, is a really good way to show that you personally are somebody who's invested in that person. If it is your own state rep, your own congressman or whatever, uh, it helps show that you are part of, of the community. The advantage of a PAC is that, you know, a lot of smaller donations pool together becomes a bigger donation. And that enables then uh, an organization or a company or, you know, a certain cause to actually then go in with perhaps a, a, you know more more money. I mean, at the federal level, states are all different. At the federal level, the most that uh, I think a PAC can give or a person can give is five thousand dollars. Now, most of us don't have five thousand dollars lying around to give to a candidate. But if you give you know even twenty bucks or a hundred bucks or whatever to a PAC and then pool that together, uh, that can you know that becomes a bigger donation. So I think PACs are a great way to pool resources together and look at a national level, but I would not discount the importance of giving even small donations to those uh, candidates and elected officials, incumbents uh, in your area who are people who are real champions for you. Great, thanks. Um, here's another question and, and I'll take this one. Um, someone asked what type of government, what level of government do we start with when we want to educate about um, interior design and who we are and what we do? Uh, my suggestion personally would be to start with on the state level. So it would be your state representative or assembly person, depending on what it's called, and then your state senator. Um, the majority of issues that we're dealing with us and, and affect, I think, the interior design profession most is policy being enacted on the state level. Um, there are certainly issues on the federal level that are are happening that touch the interior design profession. But I think as of right now, the issues we're most focused on, which are typically um, the occupational licensing, ability to stamp and seal, um, the um, the sales tax on services issue, the procurement issues, um, those are all um, policies that are overseen by the state. Um, so I would I would start local first, and I would find out who your state representative and or senators are, and then that's who I would go educate first. Um, and of course, it doesn't hurt to go do that on the federal level to your congressperson or federal senator, but um, but I would I would start on the state level. Um, it's really uh, most people don't know that a lot of um, what's being enacted. Um, on the state level affects them much more in their daily lives than sometimes things happening at the federal level. Um, and to that extent, even the local city level as well, um, you know, going and, and meeting your city council person or your alderman, if there are one of those in your town, um, just to talk about what you do. Because again, as you guys know, um, you're interacting a lot of times with that local building official when you have your plans and things like that. So um, that's, that's even another option. I would, I would start very local and then I would expand from there. Uh, this is another good question. Um, so if you cannot first get a meeting with the actual state senator or house representative, which person or people on staff should you ask um, to speak with instead? Andrew, any thoughts on that? Of course. Yeah, so I'll start with well, federal first. I, I admittedly, I know that better. So at the federal level, every member of Congress and every senator has legislative staff. These are called legislative assistants or LAs. Uh, for short, and they are the ones who handle uh, kind of a suite of specific policy issues, tax, education, environment, and so on. And so that is the real person that you want to in, 
really uh, engage with. Now, the thing is that those staff are, are almost, almost always in Washington, D.C. They're not necessarily um, out in the, in the district. The district staff who are back home in the district or state are working on more community-based events. So what I would suggest to people is if there's somebody uh, in the, that local office, you can first kind of do that an initial education with, an initial meeting with, just to sort of say, here you are, make a local connection. But then from them, you know, find out who that legislative staffer in Washington is, uh, at least get on the phone or email with them. Uh, I think that's really critical. At the state level, I think it depends. I mean, some state reps, I think, only have one staff person. That makes it fairly easy. Um, but I think certainly at the state level, I would say that, you know, if, if we stand, if they have, a, you know, a, a, a lead assistant, a main chief of staff or whatever like that, I think reaching out to that person is, is really important. And, and I'd add to that, you know, being yeah. a staff is really important. Uh, because they often the ones who do a lot of the detailed work and research on issues and are going to make recommendations to their boss, the legislator, about what to do. So I think building staff relationships is really important um, as well. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, I was, I'm a for, former legislative aide for um, a member of the House of Representatives in Illinois, and I actually ran for district office. So usually state officials have an office somewhere in their district, so somewhere local where they live, and then a, typically an office at the Capitol too. Um, and I ran her her district office, you know, near where she lived. And so I typically, when um, people called to meet with her and she was in the Capitol, she was at the Capitol in session, I would take those constituent meetings first and I would talk to them and, um, you know, take all their information. And then she, when she was back in the district, I would relay all that information to her. And then she would typically say, okay, you know, schedule a follow up, or I'll just give them a call or, you know, whatever, whatever the case was. But typically, especially in the district, I was that first line um, of communication. And so, again, it, it's creating staff is very important because they're kind of the gatekeepers to the representative. Um, and, and like Andrew said, typically on the state level, there's only enough, they're only allotted enough funding to have maybe one staffer. I, I was the one staffer in the office and then we had volunteers and interns and things like that, but um, it was just me. So her and I worked very closely together. And, and again, I was a gatekeeper to a lot of that information and, and access to her. So Again, it's really important, and if you can only get a meeting with the staffer, don't think of that as like a failure or something bad because, uh, um, again, they're going to relay all that information, and they're going to help you build that relationship with them. Um, so I think we have uh, uh, one uh, time for just one more quick question, and that will lead into kind of wrapping up. So um, somebody asked, if you have very limited time, what would you see as the most important action you could take to help interior design organizations move advocacy forward? Um, and that's a great question. And I do have um, just a really simple um, thing that you can do um, to, to help us. So IIDA and ASID team, have teamed up um, to, uh, we use a online grassroots system called Phone to Action, which allows us to um, send messages out to our advocates in a very quick way, you know, typically through text or an e-blast. And all you have to do um, right now is sign up for that to get our action alerts if you haven't already. Um, and so, you know, we'll work, you know, trying to compile as many advocates as we can into this system so that when something comes up in your state um, and we need you to write a lot of, you know, write a quick email to a legislator or send a tweet or post on social media, um, this is a really quick way to mobilize you guys and it and, and the system makes it really easy for you. So it's a couple clicks of a button and you can send that email or that tweet or whatnot. So I would say just make sure you're signed up for that so we can get information to you quickly. Um, and on top of that, I would just, you know, stay involved in and aware of what your local chapters are working on and or um, coalitions, if you have one in your state, make sure you're signed up for any of their newsletters or action alerts or things like that. Um, go to their website, see if they have an advocacy page, see what's on there. Um, you know, know who the advocacy person is in the chapter that you can contact if you have any questions. I'd say those are the simplest things that you can do if you're kind of um, hard on time. 
So um, again, just so you guys know, in order to sign up for Phone to Action, um, it's, it's really easy. Um, if you have your cell phones now, you can um, just text the word interior design, two words um, with a space between, and you text that to the number 52886. Um, so again, it's interior design to 52886. Um, and then you'll be asked a, a few questions um, and it will put you into our system there. And that's what we send all our advocacy alerts um, out of between IIDA and ASID. Um, and if you're a non-affiliated designer, um, but you are, do have, a, you are CIDQ certified, we also, um, a lot of times CIDQ will send our action alerts out uh, via email as well. So um, we try, you know, to reach as many as we can in the design community with those. So I, it's about three o'clock here. I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, I know there was a few questions we didn't get to, but as always, um, feel free to email myself or Brian Sukup at ASID or um, Abby Rathbun at IIDA, and we're more than happy to um, answer any of your questions. Um, our contact info is on ASID and IIDA's website um, if you need to get a hold of us. And uh, just so you guys know, we will be hosting another one of these probably early July. Uh, we haven't picked the day um, yet, but it'll be early July. And um, that one will be um, it's called Advocating Like a Pro, and it's going to go into a little more depth on um, how to conduct that effective meeting with the legislator and a lot of different communication skills um, to create an effective message and um, just a, more detail about, you know, why grassroots advocacy is important. So we look forward to um, having you guys join us for that. And um, thank you all so much. Hope everyone has a great day.